We, uh, Ellen and I put this together originally about three years ago. Oh, 2010 was the first 2010, time. 2010, so seven years Oh my ago. gosh. <laughs> and uh, uh, we've done a little more research since. And uh, uh, I have to thank Ellen in particular. She's a, she, she's a, he's a bulldog when it comes to digging out stuff. And uh, I, I just want to tell you one thing I learned from all this. Is there are no secrets about people. <laughs> if you dig around the internet hard enough and long enough, you'd be amazed what you can find out. <laughs> Good and bad. But uh, Sam Miles uh, really, really turns out to be a, a, a very interesting character. Uh, well, I, got, I got to be able to see my script. Or, yeah. Really? This, this picture uh, we think was taken in England just before he, he left to come to the United States. We're not really sure, but that's, that's, that's Sam at probably age 18. Uh, he was born in 1862 in Bristol, England, probably, but maybe in Bath. We're not quite certain about that. And he came to the United States in, in 1880, when he was 18, by himself, and probably without much more than the clothes on his back, as far as we know. Uh, here's another picture of him, uh, probably around 1915. That, that's my favorite. That's, that's Sam. By then, he was fairly well-connected. And uh, not needless to say, fairly well dressed. Look, look at the shoe shine and the uh, cigar. <laughs> watch Bob. Uh, watch Bob. We don't we don't know exactly when that picture was taken, but it's probably around 1950. No. This is not going to matter. That, that's. You're getting me confused. We can see. Is that okay? Yeah. Well, let's leave it there. Uh, he, we found a passport application that he filled out when he was 62. His height, he was not a tall man. He was 5'8 in height. His eyes were blue, nose straight. Uh, the mouth, the, there must have been a form that talked about his mouth, and that was not filled out. His hair was light brown, his complexion was fair, and his face was said to be oval. That's the, <laughs> there it is. You can see the stamp. He, uh, he turns up in, in the uh, United States Census reports first in, in 1900, and he was living in uh, Kane County, Illinois, which is outside Chicago, I think. Uh, <clears throat> this list his wife as his, his wife was Mary, this is his first wife, and as I'll tell you later, his only wife. Uh, uh, later documents refer to, refer to her as Jessie or Maud Mary. She was born in England in 1863. Uh, at the time this census was taken, they'd been married for eight, eight years. Next, there's the, there's uh, there's their marriage certificate, as it appears. That's that's Aww. Maud Mary, uh, rather attractive lady. Maud Mary would would uh, if you go back to the 1900 uh, census, there there is a son listed. He, he was, he, he came to South Bristol when he was a boy many times. He was born in 1895, but he was adopted by the Mileses in, uh, as an infant. He was, the adoption papers are, are written in ink, but you can't read them. <laughs> it, 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 it's, it's, it's almost out of Charles Dickens. He's referred to, the baby is referred to as a foundling. Mm -hmm. which is a word that I don't think we 
used in that context much anymore. His given name was Paul Hamilton, but the Mileses changed, changed his name when they adopted him, and it, it was, he had quite a handle. It was Arthur Thomas Stone Miles. Mm -hmm. He was called by the family Arthur. Here's the, here's the next slide. There he is in his baby clothes. <laughs> Very fancy. Looks like a mink coat. <laughs> it almost does. Uh, the adoptive mother, his, his mother's name is in this, in the adoption papers was Jesse M. Miles, probably because of Maud Mary, interestingly enough, only about five feet tall, was an absolute championship bicycle rider. Their bicycle, cycling was a big deal mm -hmm. about this time, and she was, she was a champion. She, <laughs> they're, they're, we have a couple of, a picture of some of her, her, her medals, Ellen. The, yeah, well, I just, there's more than Mary. Well, there, yeah, there's, there's Jesse she Oaks. Was an adult. Jesse Oaks. Yeah, they're, they're, these are two of her cycling medals. That she, <laughs> she, the one on the right was in an 18 hour race in Chicago in 1887. The one on the right <clears throat> was a 48 hour race held in New York uh, in 1889. <laughs> so she, she was uh, an interesting lady. Now, okay. Sam and Maud Mary were separated in the final decade of the 20th century, the 1890s. She, did, she apparently did not believe in divorce. I don't know that she was a Catholic, but she didn't believe in divorce. And Sam respected that. Uh, so they, there's, there's no record of a divorce uh, or of any second marriage that we can find. So that, we'll leave that hanging for, for a little while. Now the next, the next slide is a document uh, from the New York court where Sam Miles' will was probated and it confirms that his widow was Maud Mary Miles living in California where she, she died in 1934 of heart complications, which may have been associated with her bicycling and heavy <laughs> exercising. <clears throat> Miles Sam himself uh, died uh, on a trip in England visiting his sister in 1932. Apparently had a, a massive heart attack or a stroke uh, at the age of 70. Now, I, I want to move now to, to what Sam Miles did when he wasn't hunkered down here at Christmas, at, uh, Christmas Cove. He came in, to, as we said earlier, to the States in 1880. And just, just before that, he, he had a job as a newspaper reporter for the Bristol Mercury. That's Bristol, England, uh, beginning at age 14. He was a... He was, a, he was a very competitive athlete, actually. This, this I didn't know. He was a competitive cross-country runner. And he formed, as a, as a teenager, an athletic club called the Clifton Alvin Harriers. Clifton was a, was a section near, uh, near Bristol where the ground is pretty steep and uh, it's a fairly famous location in, around Bristol. And then, by the way, that's why Sam named his estate here Clifton. Oh. It was that connection. <laughs> and he, uh, he, when he came to the States and got off the ship, the first thing he did was to get a job with one of the New York newspapers as a, as a runner. They had these, you know, they didn't have communications the way they do today. They had to have hired these kids to run documents around town and that sort of thing. Uh, excuse me. He also, in the, in the 1900 census report, he, his, his occupation was, he was listed as the editor of a magazine about cycling called Cycling Age. We don't know much about this magazine. I've never seen a copy of it, but we do have some pages of advertising that uh, have survived. Uh, there's a 1933 New York Times article 
having to do, that talks about the automobile shows. He says that it said that the modern automobile show was an out, outgrowth of another kind of sales display of the annual cycle show. Mm -hmm. These, <laughs> it's funny, these cycle shows were ably managed by Samuel A. Miles, mm -hmm. later to become identified with the automobile show business, uh, an enterprise in which he was a moving spirit until his death. And that, that, that he really was, as you will see. You probably both of you know a little bit about this anyway. He, he, he's been called the father of the modern automobile show. The first, the first automobile show in this country was held in Chicago in 1901. Think what, what cars looked like in 1901. This was a, must have been fairly interesting. Not long afterwards, he got hired to manage the National Auto Show in New York. Here, here's here's a, a photo. Too bad it's so small, but he, he that's Sam. He's standing in the in the uh, vast arena in Chicago where the 1901 Auto Show was going to be held, and he's looking out upon the the, uh, the interior of the building. Another article uh, in 1963 in the Chicago Tribune newspaper paints a, a picture of the earliest auto shows put on by Sam, uh, referring to <laughs> as an imaginative pioneer writer on a pioneer trade show, okay. trade journal rather, Motor Age, which built a a lifetime, who built a lifetime career on the foundation of the first Chicago Auto Show in 1901. He, he was, a, in effect, a turn-of-the-century showman mm -hmm. who really started something when he gambled that he could get the rental back from the Coliseum uh, from the 50 cents a person admission charge that he, 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 he put in place. <laughs> they came. They came in and they looked at models of two gas buggies, three steamers, and five electrics. That was the, that was the, the, the sum total. The article goes on describes a big indoor window track. Citizens were given free rides. One of the local aldermen was given a driver's a driver's lesson, and uh, there was a big a big floral parade. It was quite a, quite a show. <laughs> here, 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 this, this will get you. In 1904, the auto show, Sam had huge mirrors put on the, on the floor of the Chicago Coliseum so people could see what was underneath the, these, these, these gas buggies, which were pretty, pretty unusual in those days. <laughs> The most, the most elaborate one that he, he did was in 1927 when he was really on a roll. <laughs> he had a, had a show on a Persian theme, including 15,000 yards of Persian cloth, gold cloth, a giant, a giant figure of King Darius and his chariot, and, <laughs> and other chariots engaged in what was supposed to be a lion's hunt at the other end of the room. <laughs> then again, in, in 1914, uh, the Motor Age magazine had, had, had a cartoon image of Sam. Oh. And there, there, I, you, I, I wish we could reproduce this article. It's quite long, it's about seven or eight pages, of small type. But <laughs> that, that, that cartoon is it's the impresario of the of the show, that you can you can recognize the face. It's mm -hmm. Sam, all right. Uh, we're 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 uh, in, uh, we're grateful for Deb Storch, who was looking trying to find some stuff about Sam. She was trying to find a picture. A picture of him, <laughs> and she she, <laughs> ran, she uh, found question. this on the internet oh, someplace. Yeah, yeah. It, it came from. Uh, 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 the, uh, the, the magazine, uh, what, what's the name of the Motor, motor Age. Uh, motor Age again, right. right. 
And he, he of course, got involved in other, other ways with the auto industry in the United States. He was an officer of the New York Motor Club, of the National, he was a manager of the National Association of Auto Manufacturers, and uh, he was on a bunch of committees, track, track racing and so on. Uh, he was, here's an article, I think it's from the New York Times, uh, chairman of the Orphan's Day Run in New York. Over 200 cars were promised so that the orphans could be given rides around Manhattan and, uh, and that sort of thing. In the long, by the time of the First World War, and by, he became a leader in the wartime effort to, to uh, increase the use of highways for rural transportation. And the Rural Motor Express was created by the Government's Council of National Defense. There, there's its, its certificate. Uh, now to, to move on, I, I want to tell you a couple stories about the son, Arthur. He, he, he was adopted, by, as I said, by Sam and Maud Mary, his wife, his first wife, his only wife, uh, in 1896 when he was a year old, and uh, by the time Sam acquired the first of the piece of property uh, on the island, which became his, what we all call the Miles Estate, he, uh, he, uh, he, Arthur would have been about 12 when Sam first came here to South Bristol. Uh, he, we have a genealogy of this kind of thing you get on the internet. It's sometimes hard to read, but this 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 census is from 1930. It uh, has Arthur and his wife, his then wife Geneva, who by the way was born in Lewiston, Maine, of all things. Uh, his, he had two daughters, uh, Mary Elizabeth and Virginia. And we'll talk about Virginia a little bit later. We we met her. She's a charming woman, but she's uh, about my age, which is pretty old. <laughs> and Ar and Arthur, Arthur was, uh, he, he liked car stuff, and his occupation in the census is auto mechanic. Uh -huh. <laughs> he lived in, uh, at the time of his father's death, in 1932, Ar Arthur was living still in California. Uh, with, as his, mo his mother was. Arthur himself uh, lived to, to uh, uh, 1976. Mm -hmm. uh, the first uh, daughter, Betty, or Elizabeth, never married. She died in 2009. Uh, Virginia uh, Miles uh, is married to a guy named Richard Saunders, and they live in, a, in, in Barnardsville, North Carolina, which is a little, almost a wide place in the road outside Asheville, to put it, put it in context. She's a very pleasant lady. She's an artist, kind of a crafts lady. She works in fiber and leather and other things. She has three daughters, seven grandchildren and three great-grandchildren. Uh, we, we visit them at their home in Barnardsville. They're very nice people. She talked about her father, and she is donated to this little historical society a lot of stuff having to do with letters, uh, original letters having to do with her father and uh, and their the the family. <laughs> she told us she told us uh, this story about not Sam but her father Arthur. Said dad, and this is her Arthur is referred to as dad, and I'm quoting her now. Dad spent a lot of time on the estate. He used to tell me that one of his jobs was shutting the power off at night. Sam had his own electrical system up there. Uh, shutting the power down at night and then running like the Dickens to get in the house before the power went off completely. I imagine the thing was run by by a, an engine with a big flywheel, so it uh, kept turning for a while after you turned it off. So, 
excuse me, I'm tangled up here. Now, now, let, now let's talk about uh, 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 the second Mrs. Miles that she was thought to be, and was treated <laughs> as such, Isabel. She did. Uh, <laughs> she, uh, the only, I, I'd say this, the only Mrs. Miles that we in South Bristol knew was Isabel. <laughs> Isabel R. Miles. Sam definitely considered her as his wife. He introduced her as his wife, and even in the passport application in 1918, he referred to her as his wife. But it's true, they were never legally married because Sam never got a divorce from Maud Mary. <clears throat> There's a, her obit, which was, she died in, 19, in uh, 1948, I think. Uh, reads, Samuel Arthur, Ar no, I'm sorry, I'm, I, I beg your pardon. This, this is Sam's obit. He died in 1930. Uh, Samuel Arthur Miles of Christmas Cove, Maine, wife of the late A, A Samuel A. Miles. That's when Isabel died in 1948. Um, she worked as his secretary at his office in New York, probably in New York, we don't really know. Uh, and Miles and his Maud Mary, as I said, were never divorced, so it was sort of an interesting kind of thing. Uh, a, yeah, you've all seen the, the portrait of the two of them in the hospital, mm -hmm. in the little reception area back where you, where you go when you try and get in. <laughs> I, I think the, th those are artist drawings, they're not photographs, and uh, I personally think the one of Sam is a little misleading because if you go and look at that, you think you're looking at a guy who's well over six feet tall, and we know <laughs> Sam was 5'8", but neither, that's neither here nor there. Uh, some of the, some of uh, Isabel's family stuff we have found, not much, but some. Uh, her family family name was almost certainly originally spelled Reese, R-I-E-S. Some records used R-E-E-S-E. -E -E. <laughs> both, both she and Sam used different spellings at different times, we found. Uh, we did, we, we did find in the 1880 census that Isabella Reese, R-I-E-S, born in 1876 in Philadelphia. Uh, her parents were Charles and Pauline Reese, R-I-E-S, who had immigrated from Germany. And their native tongue was Yiddish. And I say that with just as a fact. Now, let me tell you a little bit now about Sam and what he was doing here in South Bristol, which is also pretty interesting. He, uh, he apparently had some close friends in Portland when he was in this automobile show stuff. And he was visiting, the sto as the story goes, he was visiting the friends in Portland, and he, he said he was, I love this, he said he was looking for a place where he could smoke all day and wear a sweater with patches on the elbows. <clears throat> and his friend said, you ought to go take a look at, at, uh, at South Bristol or Christmas Cove. And he was sort of intrigued because he'd come from Bristol, England. Mm -hmm. And at, at this time, uh, South Bristol was still a part of Bristol. Mm -hmm. It split in 1915. <clears throat> so he, 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 he thought it might be nice to come down here and take a look. And uh, he did, and he, as early as 1908, he had bought some of the land that later became the estate. Uh, he got it from, he bought some land from a guy named Keniston, from a Booth Bay Land Company, and from George Clifford and George Lakin. Uh, these, uh, I, don't, I don't know these guys, or know who they are. But then he, he, almost every year after that, 
he, he picked up another little piece. He bought it. <laughs> He, he bought, it, bought a piece in 1909, 1911, 1919, 1912, 1919, 1920, 1922. And by the time this had all put together, the, the estate, we'll call it, was considerably larger than, than the Cowan estate today. But a lot of it's been, a lot of the shore frontage on John's Bay has been sold off over the years. But, this, that's kind of hard to read, but it, what it's supposed to show is the, what I think was the boundaries of the original Miles Estate, uh, and, and which included all the Johns Bay Shore front, and as well as, and then the other, the other line is the Cowan property today, which is, Considerably smaller, but still pretty impressive. Uh, <laughs> as I said to you earlier, he, he 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 decided to call the place Clifton because of the, right. the place in England that he was familiar with. Uh, <laughs> the tower, the Miles Tower, as we call it. Uh, one of the one of the uh, Guys who worked up there for Sam back then was Alba Farron, mm -hmm. uh, and he tells he tells a story that he, he says that the tower was a birthday gift to to Isabel. <laughs> I don't know why she wanted the tower, <laughs> but she got one, <laughs> and uh, and it reminded Sam of apparently on the English uh, Channel's side of the peninsula between where Bristol is. There, there, there's some towers on the cliffs that I guess they used to watch for ships and stuff. And it reminded Sam was remembered that, and 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 that's one of the reasons he wanted the wanted the tower. He, he had a, a, Alva Farron said apparently said that Sam had a telescope that he kept in his main house. He could actually see the gauge on the water tower up in the top of the tower, which he had for yeah. a lot of reasons. Uh, uh, get to that, but he could he could see the gauge, and if it needed replenishing, he could turn on the pump <laughs> and fill it up. He was he was concerned about fire, and he had apparently had a system of pipes that ran around the property, so he could put out a fire without <laughs> without having to uh, get any help. Uh, the other guy who worked up there, or knew a bit about it, is, was Merlin Rice. And I, 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 I we can't. don't have time for that. Okay, we, okay, we don't have time for that. <laughs> we'll tell you about that. Sam, as you may or may not know, was extremely active here in in, in the community and in Damascata with local uh, organizations. He was, uh, he was in the Rotary Club, he was a mason, he was, on, he was involved in Lincoln Home as it was back then, and he was on the board of the uh, old hospital in Damascata, which I, most of us weren't even alive. When, uh, it, was, it was called the uh, Lincoln County Memorial Hospital. On Elm Street, the one on Elm Street. That's right. That's exactly right. Mm -hmm. It's gone. It's the Clark Apartments. Clark Apartments. Okay. Right. That's that building. And he also uh, was also involved in the summer community at Christmas Cove, and he did a term in the 1920s as the president of the CCIA, which was pretty small potatoes to him by then. <laughs> this will amuse you when when. When South Bristol people were were mainly from down here were trying to extricate themselves from Bristol in 1913, they had to, in order to do this you had you had to get you had, the legislature had to pass an act allowing a town to split. And in 1913, there, there was one guy up in up in Augusta who who was an opponent. <laughs> he. Uh, 
he, uh, I, this is a quote, he, uh, one man owning a third of Rutherford Island <laughs> has had it fenced in and not a foot of it can be purchased by any except those of his class. <laughs> they come to the legislature asking you to give them this island that they may fence it about and establish here a miniature Eden, <laughs> which where they will be exempt from the tax necessary to maintain the municipality. And the one man is, of course, without doubt, Sam Miles, which I think is not, not a fair, fair uh, <laughs> description of the guy. He, <laughs> uh, it, 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 during World War I, Sam offered to have designed and pay for a, a an uh, arch to put over the road up, up, up by Hanley's. And say one saying Bristol this way, South Bristol that way. <laughs> and he was going to pay for it and have it done. And <laughs> the town of Bristol refused to accept it. <laughs> so it never got built. We have a picture of it. It's grotesque. Yeah. It's probably just it is grotesque. Right. Probably yeah, at the Historical Society, yes. they have, have a, the architect drawing. Uh, you, you, mm -hmm. Most of you know know something about the summer camp. Uh, that's really interesting. He uh, he uh, he started in, in, in the early 20s, 1920s. He actually formed a, a separate corporation called Miles Little Harbor, and he transferred the property where those the cottages on the shore are to the to the camp corporation. Took it out of his own name. Uh, and he, 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 uh, <coughs> he as, you, as some of you probably know, he, he, by, by now he was a fairly prominent figure in places like New York, and he, he, he was prominent enough to be able to get some pretty interesting people to come to the camp and entertain the kids, including Babe Ruth. Uh, We'll show you a picture of the babe up in the house yeah. later. Uh, uh, Arthur, his son, and now Virginia Saunders, has a baseball that Babe Ruth gave Arthur with his signature on it. I've seen it. It, 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 it really is. A, it's a real 1920s baseball with Babe Ruth. Here, here's the picture of, you can't see it very well, but the, the, the top picture is a bunch of adults sitting around the fireplace in, 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 in the cottage up there, if you've ever been in it, that big living room. Mm -hmm. <laughs> uh, on, the, on the right is uh, Babe Ruth and his wife, whose name I forget. Uh, and on the left is 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 uh, <coughs> Isabel and some members of her family, and they're very they're having a nice time with a drink around the fire. This must have been after Sam's death in the 1930s. So, okay. another celebrity. How, how many of you remember the uh, the actress uh, Ruth Gordon? She was, mm -hmm. uh, she, 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 she became famous as a stage actress, mm -hmm. as a fairly young person, and uh, there, there, there she is. But uh, uh, Sam knew uh, Ruth Gordon pretty well, apparently, and uh, um, she, she. I, I actually met her once she, she, when she came to an old Holiday Inn. But uh, she first came to Christmas Cove when she was a very young girl, back around in the early part of the, the 19th of the 20th century. And she had pleasant memories of it, apparently. And she uh, stayed at the Holiday Inn. And she, she eventually married a, a fellow actor named Gregory Kelly. Well, I don't remember, but apparently he was fairly famous in his day. <laughs> and, and they came to uh, Christmas Cove in June 1919, apparently, because in her, 
Ruth Gordon wrote a couple of funny autobiographical books. And one of them, one of them she talk, talks about meeting Isabel and then described a trip to Europe with Isabel and Sam, which is fairly funny. <laughs> the Miles were, had plenty of money, but they didn't like to spend it. <laughs> Another guy who was involved in the camp was the uh, was a, a Salvation Army guy from Portland. His name was Walter Phillips. He was a major in the Salvation Army. And uh, he got involved in the camp. Uh, I guess a lot of the kids probably came from Portland. And he was the uh, a speaker, principal speaker, when the hospital, the present hospital, was dedicated in, in the 1940s, probably right after the war. <laughs> And he, he, he was quite a talker, I read his entire speech, it takes a while, but, which I will not do tonight. <laughs> He's, but here, here's one of the, this quote, Mr. Miles was a man who during his lifetime maintained a high regard for human values, particularly in the lives of the youth of our land. He played host during the summer months to hundreds of boys and girls from the homes of destitute families throughout the state of Maine. And now, let me, let me just talk a little bit about Sam's uh, estate when he died. It's kind of interesting what he, what he had, had his lawyers do. Uh, his, will was <laughs> his will was short and sweet, three paragraphs. The first usual instruction to pay all my debts and so on. And then the second, he said, having made ample provision for all other beneficiaries for whom I desire to provide, I give all the rest residue and the remainder of my property to, to Isabel. And the, and the third appointed Isabel as the executor of the will. Uh, when Isabel filed for probate in New York, uh, she listed the, all of the distributees of Sam, the following, Maud Mary Miles, widow of the deceased, Arthur mm -hmm. T.S. Miles, adopted son, and herself. And uh, Mary Maud had no objection to this, and we know that there was a good reason for that. Sam had earlier set up a trust which took care of, of her and, and, and Arthur. That seemed, to, that seemed to be fine with Isabel because she, 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 she set the trust up, 60000 of Sam's money, and then sent them some money every month for a, quite a while until the trust was fully funded. Uh, we could, we've never found any inventory or appraisal of the estate here at the time of Sam's death. Uh, and Isabel, during the Depression, things were not doing so well. She had, had trouble managing the, the, the property as well as the camp. But it, the camp stayed in operation, according to what we've been able to tell, uh, until 1940, just, just before the U.S. got into the Second World War. Uh, it, as Isabel died in 1948. There's a little squib from the New York Times, and you can see it. It talks about the e Elias. They were all different. Lindbergh's, they were all her relatives. <laughs> Isabel must have done a piece of work. Her, her will was not like Sam's. 41 paragraphs. <laughs> she, she listed all this stuff, her jewelry, her uh, uh, others, all kinds of small stuff. But, but, uh, She was pretty generous. She gave what was then a lot of money, 140000 to various relatives. She gave uh, specific amounts to uh, uh, her granddaughters, Betty and uh, her, 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 yeah, her granddaughters, 
Betty and Virginia Miles, Virginia Saunders now. She gave the Salvation Army a bunch of money. Uh, China Closet and her contents went to Emma, Emma Alley. And uh, Betty House has still got some cups and saucers that were in this, mm -hmm. which I think Ellen's seen some of them. No, no. She has them. And that, uh, that's the sort of the end of the story. Um, we're getting very close. Uh, the, the remainder of the property was left to some of her relatives, Isabel's relatives, and they sold it to Henry in 1953, and so the rest, the rest of the story, to you know. Now, uh, just just to end quickly. The, there, there, there are several memorials in effect to Sam and Isabel uh, around here. Some of them are well known, some of them may not be. But uh, uh, of course, the first is the hospital. Uh, Isabel bought some, bought some land she had bought in Damascot. It was, it, then it was called Walker's Point, that's where the hospital is. And she donated that. Uh, and, and 50000 to put a hospital on it. And it replaced the other old hospital over on Elm Street that some of you remember or, or know about. And um, when she died, the hospital got another 25000 and paid off a mortgage. And you can see these, all of you have probably seen the portraits in the reception area. That's. Uh, Is Is Isabel gave the church uh, in South Bristol and the Episcopal Church in Newcastle, St. Andrews, some money. Uh, and there are two other stuck here, two other memorials to Sam and Co. One of them is really interesting. It, uh, you may, you may or may not know about this one because it's on a boulder. If you go down the Miles Road past Little Harbor to the place where the camp swimming pool used to be, there's a dam. Yeah. You cross the dam and look down on a boulder on the left, you will see a plaque. And it, uh, it was put there by the Rotary Club in Damascot in 1937. And it says, it says, uh, in appreciation of Sam Miles' rotary spirit in establishing this camp. There it is. Uh, that's, a, that's a good picture of it. Uh, the other one is, of course, the, the uh, rather interesting uh, stone in the Island Cemetery. It's in the northwest corner mm -hmm. on a little raised piece of ground. And it, uh, it says, as you can see, it says Miles on top. And then there's the, the names and dates of birth of, of Sam, Samuel A. Miles and Isabel R. Miles. And the inscription, which is down here, is, is interesting. It, uh, it, it says, it's from, it's from a Hindu text, of all things. It says, Birthless and deathless and changeless remaineth the spirit forever. Death hath not touched it at all, dead though the house of it seem. Now, <laughs> here's the really interesting thing. As far as, as far as we know and other people <clears throat> know or believe, there, there, there's nothing in... There's nobody there. Yeah. <laughs> There's nobody there. Uh, it may be that Sam's ashes were put there, but when Isabel died, she wanted to be in a cemetery in uh, Ardsley, New York, outside New York City. And at any rate, <clears throat> we've actually talked to the cemetery. <laughs> the ashes of both of them are in Ardsley, New York. <laughs> so There's no, nobody home. Oh. And that's, that's who Sam Miles was. He was a, uh, a, I think, a really interesting guy, a generous guy.